So, let me remind you uh, briefly what we, uh, some of the things I proved uh, yesterday. So we started with some uh, fine algebra group. So better, uh, suppose it is connected. And so we define the notion of a Borel subgroup. So remember it's a, uh, Maximal connected solvable subgroup. And uh, among other things, we proved that uh, they are all conjugate. And we proved that um, G mod B is a projective variety. And I stated, uh, without proving it, the fact that the normalizer of B is B itself. So a nice consequence of this is that uh, G, mod, G mod B, you can think of it as uh, something, you know, well, as calligraphic B, which is the, the set of uh, Borel subgroups. Okay, since they are all conjugate, there is a transitive action of G on this set. And the stabilizer of one of these is, it's, is a normalizer, so it's B. So this is, can be identified with G mod B, so that's a more intrinsic way to think about it. So then uh, we define the uh, notion of parabolic. Subgroup, and we saw you can either think of that as a, a subgroup containing some Borel subgroup, or a subgroup such that the quotient is projective. And the goal today will be to uh, give a more detailed classification of these parabolic subgroups. Hence, of uh, the projective varieties with the transitive action of our given group G. Okay, so maybe let me uh, start with a few simple observations that we can prove using what we know. So first, well, if if P is parabolic, we have the same kind of result. It is uh, its own normalizer and uh, it is connected. Automatically. Okay? And this is a kind of result you can use, you can prove again by uh, using Borel fixed point theorem. Let me show you the proof. So let's take uh, an element of the uh, normalizer. And we want to prove that actually it's in the it's in P and even more in the connected component of P. So the observation is that uh, so we started with uh, P by hypothesis contains some Borel B, and since X normalizes P, P also contains the uh, conjugate of B by by X. Okay. But now you can, uh, well, these two groups, they are, they are Borel subgroups of G, hence they are necessarily Borel subgroups of P. So we can apply a theorem that all Borel subgroups are conjugate now in P. So th these two groups are conjugate in P. Which means that uh, I can write this, this one as a conjugate of the other one by some element in P. 
Why Sorry? Why the conjugating P? Because there's Borel subgroups of P, and in any group, all Borel subgroups are conjugate. Oh. So I apply my theorem not in G, but in P. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now they're in, in I have replaced X by, by some element in P, so you see that uh, if I um, conjugate by, by Y on the other side, I see that Y minus 1, X preserves B. So it's in the, the normalizer of B. Okay, and we know that this is, this is B. And then you see that X is the, is the product of an element of B by Y, which is in P. So X is in P. Okay. And in fact, I can uh, do even better because uh, if, I, if I take the connected component of P, P naught, in fact, B is connected, so it is contained in P naught. And I can do the same in P naught and arrive to the conclusion that X is in P naught. So finally, I, I have that the normalizer of, of P is contained in P naught, but of course is, it contains P, which contains P naught, so you have equality. Okay. Or is there something to erase? Yes. And another observation I would like to make is this, that uh, there is a kind of rigidity. Suppose that you have two, um, suppose that you have two parabolics, and so, so that they each contain a Borel, but suppose they contain the same Borel subgroups, subgroup, And suppose that uh, they are conjugate in G. Well, then they are, they are equal. And uh, well, that this is the same kind of, of, of argument. So you suppose they are conjugate, so you write P as X, Q, X minus one. So again, it contains uh, X, B, X minus one. And it also contains B. So they are conjugate by some element of P. Just like before. And now again, <coughs> this element is in the normalizer, and it's in B. And so X belongs actually to, uh, is multiple of Y by some element of B. So it's in B, P, which is P. And so you see that uh, Q is equal to P. Okay. So again, if we uh, use the result on the normalizer, we have that, uh, It's better to think about G mod P call it P so it's the set of parabolics which are conjugate to P and uh, there is a unique one containing a, gi containing a given uh, Borel subgroup Okay, so the homogeneous varieties of, of G are really the, uh, the spaces parameterizing the different types of, uh, of parabolic subgroups. And this, this, this statement will be very important to get the, the classification.
So something we also discussed was the, uh, the structure of our solvable groups. So remember that uh, being solvable, we, have, we had a decomposition, the same direct product of B in the, the unipotent part. And uh, T, which is a torus. Okay? And actually, T sin in G is a, a maximal torus. Remember that uh, I'm talking about algebraic tori, which are subgroups that are isomorphic to groups of diagonal matrices, if you wish. And it is a fact, an untrivial fact, that uh, all maximal tori are conjugate in G. Since I'm talking about that, there is another fact that I will not prove, which is also important. Then if you look at the normalizer of T, so this is a group which is uh, closely related to T. It, has a, it is equal to T up to a finite group. So the quotient is, is finite. So this is called the, the Vi group. So it does not depend on T since all tori are conjugate. And uh, it will play an important role in, uh, in the story. No, at this point, no. Yeah, yeah. T, T is always made of semi-simple elements, so by definition. So for those of you who were at the uh, seminar yesterday evening, uh, we had the, the definition of our reductive and semi-simple groups. So the, the, there is a definition of the, uh, the radical of a group. This is, is the maximal normal uh, connected solvable subgroup. Oh, gee. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Uh, do you require G to be reductive in your effect? To be? Do you require G to be reductive in your effect? No. Well, I'm coming to that. Okay, I gave the result too, too early. Sorry. Yes. So I should not have given this at this moment, but uh, later. So I have to give the definition of reductive. Yeah, so there is this notion of radical. So now again, we consider, uh, like in, when I defined Borel subgroups, and if uh, introduced connected, they were defined as maximal connected solvable subgroup. And here mm -hmm. I have this normality hypothesis. So one can show that if you have two such groups, normal uh, 
connected solvable, the, the, gen the group that generates has again the same property. So um, there is really one maximal group of this kind, which is denoted by R of G. Okay? And um, being solvable, it has uh, the decomposition I discussed, the unipotent part, and some, some torus. So the definition is like that. So G is reductive if uh, this unipotent part is trivial. And it's semi-simple. if the whole radical is trivial. Okay. So there is this abstract definition. And you see that the difference between uh, reductive and semi-simple groups is just uh, given by tori. Okay. If you have a, a reductive group, you just need to mod out by some torus to make it semi-simple. Okay, since, since those groups are normal, if we have uh, any group, we can mod out by the, uh, in the unipotent part of the radical to get uh, a reductive group. And if we mod out by the whole radical, we have a, a semi-simple group. And the point here is that, uh, well, remember our goal is to classify uh, varieties, projective varieties, on which uh, an affine algebraic group does act uh, transitively. And you see that this little observations that uh, if G acts transitively on X projective variety, then uh, the radical acts trivially. And this is an obvious consequence of uh, Boyle's fixed point theorem. Okay, we can apply the fixed point theorem onto the radical, since by definition it is a solvable connected group. So it has a fixed point. Next. Okay, but since uh, it is normal, any translate. Uh, will again be a fixed point. By normality, this, uh, this is immediate. And then, uh, well, since the action is transitive, any point is a fixed point. So the action is trivial. So this means that uh, as far as we are interested in homogeneous projective varieties, we can just consider semi-simple groups. Okay, we can just mod up by the radical and uh, consider only the quotient the action reduces to G mod the radical, which is semi-simple. Any question so far?
So it turns out that this uh, assumption of uh, semi-simplicity or uh, reductivity is really, really very restrictive. So. There is a, so probably you, you know about that. But let me remember a few, a few facts uh, briefly. So, uh, or maybe, so, I will talk about the uh, joint representation. So to be safe, I will uh, stick to characteristic zero from now on. So in, you have the, you certainly know about that, but let me remind you briefly uh, how you can define the Lie algebra of G. So algebraically, you start from the, uh, the main object of study is the algebra of regular functions. And then you, have, uh, you can look at the derivations. But so remember that we had we have a, an action of G on the, we have actually two actions of G on the, on the set of functions by left or right translation. So let's take the right action and uh, I denoted it by rho x. Okay, and then you can, uh, so by, by definition, the Lie algebra is the, um, the space of invariant derivations. Okay, so this set of deri derivations that commute with uh, the, the action of G. And maybe you're more familiar to the uh, definition as the tangent space to the uh, group at the identity. Okay, so derivations on the local ring. You can, there's an isomorphism given by, to a derivation D, you associate the, uh, the map defined by taking a function, you apply D, F and you just evaluate that one. Okay, so this gives you a, a tangent vector and there is this uh, isomorphism here. So what is, uh, well it's, it's interesting to have both interpretations and you, you see from the, uh, you know it anyway, but uh, and the, the bracket of two derivations is a derivation, so there is a, a Lie algebra commutator of derivations. Gives you a, a Lie algebra structure. Okay, just a quick reminder. You all know that. And you also know that there is an action of the, of the group on its Lie algebra. Okay, you have this uh, section of G on itself by uh, conjugation. It stabilizes the identity, if you take y, y is sent to the identity, so you can, uh, the differential. Gives you an action of. of G on the, uh, on the Lie algebra. Okay. Adjoint with the capital A, and there is a 
So if you differentiate this, you get uh, a little adjoint, which is just the, um, the bracket. Okay. This is how you make the uh, connection between uh, the, li the Lie bracket as defined here and the, the action of G on the Lie algebra. Okay. So now in the setting of uh, reductive or semi-simple groups, this will be uh, drastically restricted. So the idea is to, to use a maximal torus. Okay, an element of the maximal torus, there are uh, diagonal matrices, there are some uh, simple elements. So you can diagonalize the action of, uh, on, on the Lie algebra. And since these, uh, the element of T all commute, you can simultaneously diagonalize the, the action. So that's what you do. So you, you define the eigen, eigenspaces. So what are they? G alpha, so the space of elements in the Lie algebra, such that uh, when you apply an element of T, you get some multiple of X by some element alpha of T. And so what is alpha? Alpha. So you see by definition it's a, a homomorphism from a T to a, the multiplicative group. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we mark what is this group? So we know that T is a group of uh, diagonal matrices. Okay, so suppose T is a So what is the homomorphism from T to, to the multiplicative group? It's, it's something of the form. You take a matrix like this and you, you must have the product of powers of, of the TIs, where the A1, AR are relative integers. Okay, so you see that this uh, space of homomorphisms is uh, Naturally, well, not naturally, but isomorphic to Z to the R. Okay, so we decompose the action of T and, uh, into eigenspaces like that. And so the fact is that, uh, oh, I should mention that, uh, okay, so fact, so suppose G is reductive. Then G decomposes as T, the Lie algebra of of the tor maximal torus plus the sum of these eigenspaces. Okay, so so I denote by phi those that are non-zero, and uh, can can prove that the dimension of these spaces is one. I called it. Yes. Okay, so phi. I said is the space of uh, yes, I forgot the uh, usual notation from for the uh, homomorphisms from T to GM. So this is the character group. So 
So this is called the, the root system. Okay, and really we have this um, important property that the root spaces are only one dimensional. Okay, so here you have T. Um, a priori, this should be the, uh, the zero eigenspaces, so the set of uh, elements in G that uh, commute with, uh, with T, so which is the Lie algebra of the normalizer. And uh, as it was remarked, in the case of uh, when G is reductive, the normalizer is uh, T up to a finite group, so the Lie algebras are the same. So here we get T and uh, and you see that uh, apart from T, we have uh, decomposed the action in, uh, in almost completely into eigenspaces. <coughs> and an obvious but important remark is that when you take the commutator of uh, two of these root spaces, This is contained in the root space. It follows from the definition. So I denote the, I use the isomorphism with dr to uh, use uh, an additive notation. So this is contained in G alpha plus beta, at least if uh, this is non-zero. So it can happen that alpha plus beta is not a root, so you, can, you will get zero. These two spaces will commute. And if beta is minus alpha, then you get something which is contained inside the, uh, the Lie algebra of the torus. Okay. Questions? Sorry? Yes. So minus alpha will be not a root. Yeah, so, but as I said, I use this uh, as an isomorphism with ZR, and then it's more convenient to use the additive notation. So you write that it, alpha plus beta should be rather the product of, uh, if you really think in terms of homomorphism, that's really the product. That's Yeah, so something important is that uh, there is something corresponding to, del to that decomposition at the level of the group. Okay, the Lie algebra is a kind of linearization of the group. And so we have uh, information of this uh, linearization, but in fact, uh, we can lift it to the group in this, in this way. So. It was maybe. So for, for any uh, root alpha, there exists uh, homomorphism from the uh, additive group to uh, some subgroup U alpha of G. whose Lie algebra is exactly the, the root space G alpha. Okay, so we have an incarnation of these root spaces. There's really some uh, unipotent subgroups. So this, this will be unipotent subgroup of G, which are normalized by the torus. <coughs> okay, so we see the decomposition at the level of the group. And uh, the group will be generated by T and, uh, and these subgroups. So they, they provide you essentially all the information, not only on the Lie algebra, but also on the, on the group. 
So uh, an important remark is that um, uh, well, think think of uh, SL two. So SL two is the simplest of the uh, semi-simple Lie algebras. Okay, so matrices uh, zero trace. So you can take as a maximal torus the. Uh, well, the Lie algebra of the maximal torus will be the diagonal matrices. And then you have the uh, strictly upper triangular and strictly lower triangular matrices. So this, this is exactly the root space decomposition. Okay. And so. Uh, Something which is important is that for any root, actually, uh, you can take uh, G alpha. So you can show that minus alpha will also be a root. And you can take the commutator. So you get some. Uh, subspace U alpha, which is actually isomorphic. This is a sub Lie algebra isomorphic to SL2. Okay, this part is always contained in the, in the Lie algebra of the torus. And what you get is, uh, you can show that it is necessarily isomorphic to SL2. And so you see that uh, what well, the theorem tells you is that these reductive algebras, they are made of SL2. Okay, each, each, pair, each pair of uh, a root plus the opposite roots gives you some SL2 inside G. And uh, these SL2 are combined together in some, uh, in some way, which is encoded by some combinatorics that I will not describe in detail, but uh, essentially the, the idea is that one. A bunch of SL2, uh, mixed in a, in a combinatorially uh, complicated way. Okay. So now we can also describe the Bore subgroups. So let's think about the Lie algebras, which will be, uh, again, maximal solvable sub Lie algebras. So suppose that B uh, contains T, so the, the Lie algebra of B contains my, uh, my T. Then since uh, the action of T normalizes B, uh, B must be uh, the sum of T plus some root spaces. Okay, so necessarily, since it contains T, it must be the sum of certain root spaces. And the root spaces that appear, I will, I will denote them by phi plus. Because of the following, well, for any root, alpha or minus alpha belongs to, to phi plus, but not both. Well, why not both? Because uh, if they are both contained in B, if G alpha and G minus alpha are contained in B, well, you see by this observation that uh, U alpha will, would be contained in B, and U alpha is SL2. But in a solvable subgroup, you cannot have SL2. SL2 is its, is its own derived group. So if you have some SL2 by taking a, a derived series, you, you will always keep it. 
this contradiction with uh, solvability. And by maximality, you show that uh, you must have at least one of the, one of one of the, one of the, one of those. Okay. So in other words, the phi is the disjoint union of phi plus and uh, minus phi plus. Okay. So B really splits the roots into uh, two different parts. Positive roots and negative roots. They're opposites. And uh, we have the same at the level of, uh, of the group. Well, you can show that B as a group, well, rather as an algebraic variety, is the product of uh, T with the uh, groups U alpha or alpha and phi plus. Okay, so th which really means that you can write an element of B in a unique way as an element of T and uh, elements of uh, these root subgroups. So you have to fix an order and then you have this uh, decomposition. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind that everything that happens at the Lie algebra level has its counterpart at the level of groups. Okay, so uh, so this will help to understand the the phi, the root system. So essentially, this is what we need to understand to to understand the group. Okay, so you define uh, delta in phi, in phi plus to be the set of simple roots. In the sense that they cannot be decomposed and in the sum of positive roots as alpha equals beta plus gamma, beta and gamma in phi plus. Okay, so remember, remember this property that G alpha, the commutator of G alpha and G beta is G alpha plus beta, which means that uh, either these two root groups commute or they don't commute while the sum of alpha and beta must be a root. Okay. So here we go on the reverse direction. We define simple roots as, as those that are not sums in any way. And then uh, one can check that there are exactly R simple roots, where R is we call the dimension of T. And so this means that any, any root in phi plus will be a combination of uh, these uh, simple roots with uh, integer non-negative coefficients. So using this, you see that uh, by, by w once you have the, the simple roots, you can get the other roots by uh, taking brackets. So this, this will imply that you can, you can just generate the group, or let's say the borel subgroup can be generated by uh, T and uh, U alpha. To give you some uh, minimal sets of, uh, of generators in some way.
Okay, so. I wanted to give uh, the definition of a. Uh, We'll come back to the Vi group. Mm. Remember, the Val group is essentially the, the normalizer of the torus divided by T. So being the normalizer of the, of the torus, it preserves everything which is defined in terms of the, the torus. So in particular, it, it will preserve the, the root space decomposition. So, so the role of the Val group, let's say. So preserve the root decomposition. Uh, which we can state uh, as the following. So suppose that uh, W is in the Val group. So I take, uh, I can lift it to the normalizer. So I put a dot to Say that I have an element in the normalizer whose quotient by T is, uh, is W. Okay, then when you conjugate your subgroup U alpha, okay, so remember this was a, one of these uh, unique uh, unipotent subgroups corresponding to the root subgroups. So, since W preserves T, this, this group must be is of the same type. So it's again, it's another of the of the root groups. So by some group which I denote by W alpha. Okay. So you see that the, there is an action of the Val group on phi. And you can be a little more precise using this remark uh, I made that uh, the Lie algebra is made of SL2s. So if you have a SL2, uh, so you, you, the torus is given by diagonal matrices, and the Val group is, corresponds to the permutation of the, the two. Uh, the two vectors that gives you the common eigenvectors of the torus. The Val group of SL2 is just uh, Z mod 2. Okay. Permutation of the two vectors. So then you can use that to, uh, you can apply this to uh, the Lie algebra U alpha. And you can show using this that uh, you can lift this uh, involution to an element of the Val group. So there is some uh, well defined S alpha, which is a reflection. So it's a this 
reflection will send alpha to minus alpha and it will fix a, a complementary uh, hyperplane. So you can, you can, okay, it's really sensitive only to this part of the, uh, of the, of the Lie algebra. So this implies that you can write S alpha in the, in the following way. There is a some alpha check, so which is now in the in the dual of the space of, of the characters of the torus. This is called the co-root. And since uh, S alpha, alpha equal minus alpha, it is equal to two. Okay, so you have, uh, in terms of this co-root, you have a uh, an explicit description of the action of this reflection. And the Val group is in fact generated by those reflections, which, which allows you to understand it very explicitly. Okay, so, so what I want to insist on is that the, you can uh, essentially describe everything starting from uh, the, simple, the simple roots. Yes, this is also, in fact, it suffices to take the set of simple roots. So if you, take, if you have the simple roots and the corresponding co-roots, well, you can define the, the group that generate, and then you can recover the the whole uh, root system. It's a fact that any root is the image of a simple root by some element of the Val group. And uh, and the fact is that W acts simply transitively on uh, sets of simple roots. And remember that simple roots were defined from a, a Borel group containing the uh, maximal torus. It also acts simply transitively on, on the set of Borel subgroups containing T. So really, you can reduce almost everything to a very little number of data, essentially this set of simple roots with their, uh, their co-roots and the pairing with the co-roots, then you get the Val group, then you get all the uh, root system. And in terms of group, uh, Borel subgroups containing to T correspond to sets of simple roots. Okay. So then you can dig a bit further in the combinatorics and describe uh, exactly uh, this, combinatoric this combinatorial information I just mentioned. So this is, uh, so we have this, uh, this recipe of Dinky diagrams and so on, which I will not remind you. So Dinkin diagrams are just a way to um, encode this information, encode the, uh, the relevant uh, combinatorial information. Mm. 
So essentially, you have uh, the roots, the co-roots, and uh, the pairing. And again, once you know that, you can uh, reconstruct essentially everything. So maybe let's uh, recapitulate. what we did for uh, GLN. Okay, so GLN is, uh, is not reductive. Okay, there is a radical which is the, the space of uh, homothesis. Which is a torus, one-dimensional. The same, the same as when, when you, if you want a semi-simple group, you need to take SLN. But let's stick to GLN. So that doesn't make much difference. So uh, maximal torus would be diagonal matrices. Borel subgroup, triangular matrices. Okay, then you decompose the, uh, the Lie algebra. You have the, uh, well, each entry gives you a, a root uh, alpha, usually denoted epsilon i minus epsilon j, where uh, epsilon i so should be, you see it as a character of T, so homomorphism from T to the multiplicative group, it is just Ti. Okay, so if you take a matrix which has a only a non-zero entry here, and you look at the adjoint action of the torus, the character you get will be this one. So the root system is a, a set of these differences. So now phi plus is a set of, uh, of roots such, as, such that i is uh, uh, smaller or uh, bigger. Oh, well, is my notation is bigger than j. Uh, should not be, so probably I should do this. Okay, so if you choose this Borel subgroup, this, this, this decomposes you, the root system into two, two, two halves, which are here those, and now those that are non-decomposable will give you the simple, the simple roots. So they are just the epsilon i minus epsilon i plus one. If I, if I have epsilon i minus epsilon j uh, for uh, j bigger than i plus 1, I can decompose as uh, epsilon i minus epsilon i plus 1 plus epsilon i plus 1 minus epsilon j. It's not simple. So this is the set of simple roots. And the Val group, what is that? So the torus is given by uh, uh, the composition of the space into lines, which give you the uh, eigenvectors of your element in the torus. And uh, what is irrelevant is the order of these, uh, of these lines. So the, the Val group will be the, will be the permutation group. Permute the basis vectors. You preserve the torus and the, the induced uh, action on the set of uh, roots is, uh, as you guessed, by uh, permutation of indices. 
Okay, so you see that uh, if you want to get uh, any root, you can take uh, epsilon i minus epsilon j. You can take, in this case, any simple root and uh, apply suitable permutation to the, in to the indices. And so on. A, si a simple root is just a choice of the an order of your indexes, of your indices. And uh, the val group acts uh, simply transitively, etc. Okay, and again, a Borel subgroup containing T. So, what is the difference between a torus and a Borel? Torus is given by you choose lines composition into one-dimensional spaces. And bo for a Borel, you, you need to choose a flag. So you first generate by your line. Then your second space must be generated by two of those lines, etc. OK, so really, a Borel uh, depends on an order on your set of lines. So that's what uh, happens in, uh, in general. Any question? So I still have some time. So remember, the goal is to define some uh, parabolic subgroups. So I will need another classical fact, which is the Brua decomposition. So the theorem is, uh, what should I say before? Okay. So that's the decomposition of, of G. So we have uh, an action of uh, G times G on itself by uh, left and right translation. And ends of B. Uh, times b, so it tells you how you decompose into orbits. So there is a finite number of orbits, and they are precisely indexed by the Weil group. Okay. This is the Breuer decomposition. So uh, I will not prove that. It's not very difficult, but uh, well, just maybe for, uh, for GLN. What does it mean? So, so W is SN. And what is B? So a Borel subgroup of GLN. Defining a, choosing a Borel subgroup is the same thing as choosing a flag. Okay, so let's be called stabilizer of some flag. Flag of vector spaces in, uh, in CN, in, in AN. And so, how, how do you define this decomposition? Well, the, 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 the point is that uh, if you take an element of GLN, how can you decide in which uh, part of this decomposition it is? Well, you look at the, what, what can you do? You look at the image of this flag by G. There's another flag. So you have two, two flags of vector, sp of vector spaces. And uh, what the theorem tells you is that uh, you must detect uh, something between those flags by uh, an element of the symmetric group. And uh, this element of the symmetric group is given by the relative position of these two flags.
Okay, so wh what do I mean? Well, I, so I have, uh, I take, that's fi, the, uh, the element of my flag of dimension i, and I look at the intersection with the translate of fj. Okay. Well, I have a space, a vector space, so what can I do as then look at this uh, dimension? So the dimension is, uh, I don't know, nij. Okay, and nij is, of course, a non decreasing function of uh, i and j. If i increase i, I increase fi, so the dimension will necessarily increase. And uh, what I'm saying is that this, uh, this uh, collection of numbers define a permutation. The claim which I'll leave as an exercise is that uh, there exists a unique uh, permutation such that nij is what the number of uh, integers k at most i such that w of k is uh, at most j. Okay, so, so this tells you that the uh, relative position of two flags is uh, encoded by a permutation. And uh, if you write things correctly, this implies the uh, Boyer decomposition for GLN. Okay. Well, the general proof is, uh, slight, is, is different, of course, but uh, this gives you the idea. And it's interesting to uh, use the root groups to uh, Say more about this uh, this object because it's uh, well in the proof you actually use something which is essentially that if you look at uh, this uh, this strata in the decomposition uh, this can be written as a a product of uh, root groups. Times B. So here, uh, I should have explained something, which is that when you write W as generated by the set of reflections associated to delta, Okay, so this tells you that uh, any element W can be uh, written as, as, the, as a product of uh, these uh, simple uh, reflections. Okay, and, and there are some uh, decompositions which are better than, than the others, which are those of minimal lengths. Okay, so K minimal. Then it's, it's the, called the length of uh, W. Okay, so you know that in, we, in the case of the symmetric group, you just have uh, simple reflections. Simple uh, transposition, I mean. So S epsilon minus epsilon I plus one is just uh, what you denote sigma I usually, maybe. Transposition of i and i plus one. Okay, and you know that uh, you can decompose uh, any permutation using these transpositions, and you have this. Uh, you certainly met this notion of minimal uh, decompositions in this setting. Okay. So usually there are many ways, many different ways to write a given permutation or a given element of the right group as a product 
of simple reflections, even if you impose the number to be minimal. But then if you do that, you have this decomposition. Okay, this, each of these strata that appears uh, in the Breda decomposition can be written as a, a product of a B and some root subgroups. Which is uh, important because you have a If you apply this uh, Bray decomposition to G mod B, you have something very interesting going on. So the corollary is that G mod B, so which is now the, the product of a Same object, object, but you model by B uh, on, the, on the right. And now, by, by what I have just said, this is now isomorphic to U minus alpha 1, U minus alpha K. But remember that uh, each of these root groups is a copy of the additive group. It just uh, as, a, as a algebraic variety, is just a fine line. And this, uh, so this as an algebraic variety is just a fine space of dimension k. So what you get here is, uh, is really uh, a cell decomposition. You have decomposed your uh, G mod B into this joint union of uh, so varieties which are uh, just a fine spaces. Is? Uh, well, it's not really a direct product. It's, uh, I mean, it's a product in the group. Yes, yes. but I mean, by this I mean the, you, you take uh, you take the product map to the group. Yes, it's not. Yeah, it's not completely obvious. It follows from the structure of uh, unipotent groups. No, there are, there are many details that I don't explain. Okay, so uh, now I, I'm uh, ready to uh, define my parabolic subgroups. Yes, well, maybe some observation before is that uh, you see that uh, so you have a, a cell of uh, dimension k, and k is the, uh, the length of uh, w as I defined it. So you see that since uh, g mod b is uh, irreducible as an algebraic variety, there is a unique cell here of maximal dimension. So corollary or consequence, there exists a, so a unique cell of maximal dimension. So there is a unique permutation of maximal lengths. And then all the uh, when you want uh, dimension one more, you need to multiply W zero by uh, some uh, simple reflection. Then W zero S alpha I as length, as length one less. So you see that uh, G mod B is uh, a really a cell of dimension uh, L of W0. And then you have some cells of uh, dimension one less. So irreducible upper surfaces. And the number of those is exactly the rank. Okay. And so on.
So in fact, I provided the proof of the Brea decomposition. There is a very essential observation, which, which is not difficult, which is that this, uh, this strata are well behaved with respect to multiplication. So the, the one simple way to say this is that when you multiply a cell BWB by some cell defined by some simple reflection, then you, you will go to some other cells, but uh, you can go either to uh, the, the product or uh, stay inside the, the first cell. So essential. So this is not very difficult to prove, but uh, I don't have time to do that. And once you prove this, uh, the Brouillard decomposition follows quite easily. But what also follows is that uh, if you take Let's take a subset of uh, the set of simple roots. And look at uh, Wi, the set of uh, the subset of W, which is generated by the corresponding simple roots, simple reflections. Okay. And now you look at uh, definition. Mm. Pi is the, I could write it like this. So I mean the, uh, the disjoint union of the cells. B, W, B for W in this subgroup. Okay, so you see by this uh, property that, uh, in fact, this is a subgroup because when you multiply by, uh, when you use only elements in W which can be written in terms of these simple reflections and you make the product, you, you, the result is only involves the same uh, simple reflections. Okay, so that's, that's a subgroup. Containing B, of course. So uh, that's a parabolic subgroup. <laughs> and the result of the uh, classification is that this gives you all the parabolic subgroups. So these groups are called the standard. So the, the theorem is that any uh, parabolic subgroup of G containing B is one of these standard parabolics. Okay. So in other words, the, uh, the types of parabolics are in correspondence with uh, the subsets of delta. So the numbers is always 2 to the, uh, to the r if r is the rank. And uh, so you can do the exercise, of course, to see what happens for, uh, for GLN. Okay, so remember that uh, we had the, uh, 
like small torus like that. And uh, the simple roots were the uh, epsilon i minus epsilon i plus 1. Is the corresponding uh, simple reflection be, 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 being a sigma i. Okay? So now you choose certain of this. Uh, so root corresponds rather to something here. So you choose some of these uh, simple permutations, simple transposition, and you do WI is a group generated by those. Okay, so for example, uh, I don't know, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 4, let's say. Then what do you get? Sigma 1 and sigma 2 will, give you, will generate a permutation group in three elements. Sigma 4, an element of uh, a symmetric group of two elements. So you see that it decomposes the, uh, into blocks. Okay, you, in the first block you, uh, you have chosen the, uh, all the simple reflection, then you forget, then you don't take the next one, and etc. You, okay, you isolate those that you choose. This gives you a decomposition like that. And uh, the parabolic is just the, uh, the groups defined by this decomposition of the space. Okay, so you have zeros here. And PI is exactly this group, so this is the stabilizer of an incomplete flag defined by the dimensions are defined by the, uh, the, the subset of delta that you chose. And maybe a last observation for today is that there is a there is a hierarchy between those uh, those parabolics, so between the uh, flag varieties. So conclusion is that G has exactly. Two to the R, so different projective homogeneous spaces. So that's not completely correct, but uh, let's say, let's suppose it is. And so there is one which dominates all the other ones, which is G mod B, the full flag, full flag variety. There is one which is uh, the smallest one, which is G mod G. Not very interesting, just a point. Okay, so this one corresponds to uh, delta equals the empty set. Uh, sorry, I in delta the empty set. This one corresponds to I equal the whole of delta. And so before the point, there are the uh, those corresponding to I equal delta minus just one element. Okay, so I did just just um, uh, maybe we do not Q Q one G mod Q R. Okay, the Q I are called the so th those are the minimal varieties. So the Q I the maximal parabolics. For G L N we get the Grossmanians. So they are the uh, generalized Grossmanians. And maybe symmetrically here we have uh, those corresponding to I equal just one element. So they correspond to the minimal parabolics. And then you have, uh, you, have, you have maps, of course. So you have natural inclusion between the parabolics, which gives you projections between the 
homogeneous varieties. And maybe one, one thing you can observe is that here, the fiber is what? Is P1 mod B. And P1 mod B, uh, what is that? Well, remember that minimal parabolic means that you just add some, some uh, negative simple root. You start from B and you add minus alpha 1 in this case. P, 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 Pi is the group generated by B and U minus alpha 1. This follows from the description. So you see that P1 mod B is just one dimensional. So one dimensional uh, homogeneous variety. Rational must be P1. Okay, so we have the full flag variety, then we have P1 vibrations. And then we have vibrations by. Uh, We have maps like this, and the fiber here is uh, pi j mod pi i. So you see that's again a homogeneous space. Okay, so we have with this nice uh, structure that we have maps between uh, homogeneous varieties, and the fibers are again homogeneous varieties, so described by the same combinatorial kind of data. But better stop uh, here for today. So uh, next time I will explain some uh, how you define homogeneous vector bundles on these varieties, and I'll uh, give some uh, applications to uh, representation theory and to some uh, geometric problems if I have time. Thank you.